Welcome back to the Sideline Live podcast. You can follow us over on Twitter and Instagram at the Sideline Live. We'd love to hear from you. On episode 43, I'm delighted to be joined by Irish senior international and professional basketball player Jordan Blent. In this episode, we chat about his career, his unique path to the States as he stopped off in the UK and Spain, and so much more. This is the final episode of the Green Emmy Broad series and put the series on hold for a little while. I hope you enjoy. Hi Jordan, thanks a million for coming on the podcast. Thanks very much for having me. So before we get into everything, would you be able to give a bit of an intro for the listeners who might not know who you are? Um, yeah, so my name is Jordan Blount, um, Irish international, um, currently playing professionally in Iceland. Um, this is my second year professionally, and I just got here about a week ago or so. But yeah, I've been on the Irish teams all through the ages, um, got the chance to play in America and play all over. So for, uh, thanks for having me on. <laughs> cool, we'll get into all of that. Uh, who originally got you into basketball? Um, my dad. Yeah, 100%. My dad was such a huge basketball nerd in every sense of the matter. Um, Ref, coach, played. So I just went everywhere he used to go. So and then obviously just naturally started and wanted to play. And did you play anything else growing up or was it just basketball? No, I played football for a couple of games right. <laughs> until it, and then seriously, just couldn't hack it. Didn't like being outside, cold, <laughs> rain. I was like, nah. the muck, you were like, nah, dad, nah, lad, I'm staying inside. Of, yeah, my dad came to one of my games. He's like, I'm never coming to any more of these. <laughs> so, so the encouragement yeah. was there for basketball. It was short, yeah. it was short lived. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And when did you realize you wanted to take basketball seriously and you looked to maybe go abroad? Yeah, so when I was young, um, I think I was around 10 or 11, I'd seen the news. I was in the Echo, I'd play with my dad, you always get the Echo. So I seen that somebody from the north side of Cork had went to England to play. And obviously I'd heard of people going away before, but like never knew anybody that did. So Kyle Hosford actually went over to England. Um, the club kind of had some issues or whatever, he ended up coming back. That was my first time seeing somebody that I knew, someone that was close to where I'm from, like going away and really doing it. And then just through conversations with my dad about like, oh, this is my goal now, I want to do this, I want to go there. And it just evolved from that point. Right. And ability wise, obviously, you're extremely good at what you do. You're a professional. When did you when did you really start to put in the extra effort and training and do the extra practices outside of maybe um, an organized session? Yeah, I would say like I was look I was very lucky. I got to be around some good um I had some good mentors in my life from a basketball point of view, you know. Char Noonan would have told me and, and steered me in a lot of different directions. So I I, I knew kind of how to work out when I was young so like and that's the thing like there's a lot of people don't really know how to work out until a later point in their career but I was lucky to be around people that would guide me and steer me in the right way from that point so around 13 14 I really started to like lock in and work out try to work out every day like a serious regime and everything so quite young and what other advice would the likes of Jer and the other mentors give you um, so like the, the thing that I loved about Jer is that he had played every single position you know what I mean so he knew how to like I was tall and I played on the wing at the time like a, like I was a two guard I was a shooting guard up until about 17, 18 yeah. maybe even 19 when I was in prep school but like Jer had been in every position that I'd been playing in and like I look at my career now when I was younger I used to bring the ball up and then I was a two and then I was a three and then I was a four like Jer has literally done that so mm-hmm. he had advice from every perspective that I would have needed so it was just yeah it was great to be around him so much. Suzanne McGuire spoke about that before she said um because some of her underage coaches didn't box her into let's say the typical post because she was so tall yeah that's really what she attributes her success to because as you said there she would have played out in the wing or ball or did a lot of ball handling because yeah, yeah that's because of her coaches. Yeah no 100% it makes it makes such a difference um and that's the that's the that's the problem sometimes in Ireland. That's the problem. It's just the way it is. You know, I mean, you see a tall kid and you're like, post player. Yeah. Because yeah. we're not, like, we don't have an abundance of height or yeah. those kind of attributes. So it's whenever there's somebody a bit taller than everyone else, and it might not even be that tall, just taller. Yeah. But like, yeah, you're you're going inside. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you went to the UK. Um, was that just after your journey, mm-hmm. sir, was it? Yeah, it was right after my junior cert. Um, actually, I had the 
an option to leave a year early. Okay. But family just felt that I was a year earlier than that. But my family just thought I was a bit too young or whatever. Yeah. So the following year, another opportunity came and uh, just jumped at it and absolutely loved it. I, uh, I was in Plymouth for the year and around with some amazing people and made some great friendships. And um, was Colin, o- Colin O'Reilly was in Plymouth, was he? Yeah, or... Colin was there too. So it was super like refreshing that like my first step away into this world of basketball, I got to be around somebody that was from my city. You know what I mean? So yeah. it was, um, yeah, it was quite an easy transition for me. And even my coach and, and the man that I lived with, his name was Jay Marriott. He had been in Ireland and he had like, friendships with a lot of people that I knew like he knew Jerk quite well he played in Neptune so okay it was quite an easy transition for me for uh from that regard and how long did you spend in the UK before um you went to Spain a season so one oh, year only one year and yeah just the, less than a year yeah. and how did the opportunity go to come is it in Lanzarote the academy is it? Uh, it was in Gran Canaria at Sorry, the time Grand but Canary. yeah so like I made some contacts with so, so an, uh, an agent that's time made contact with um, my coach in England, Jay, yeah. uh, to kind of bring me out on some trials. So it was with Real Madrid, Estudiantes, Gran Canaria. Um, so then in the end, just chose that place. Um, it was a good two years, long two years, um, but definitely an environment that you get better in. You mentioned before on another podcast, I think it could have been when you were chatting to Jay Marriott, but one of the things that you're attracted to about Gran Canaria was it was just basketball. Whereas with the other cities, I think they were trying to sell the city to you. Why do you think you just, like, I'm trying to get the sense of a lot of people wouldn't just go just for the basketball. They'd want the other yeah. elements of the city. Why did you just yeah. see that? Well, when I was when I was younger, when I, when I was that age, I thought I was going to the NBA. Okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? That was my that was my dream. That was, you know what I mean? I was a young kid. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, I, I was like, yeah, I'm just going to go wherever, wherever I can just work as much as possible. Um. And I just felt like that, that kind of place. How come you didn't, like, let's say burn out? Because I know... It's not for everyone and people have gone, they've come back. That's absolutely fine. But a lot of kids yeah. wouldn't be able for that two a day, three a day. How come you didn't burn out? Yeah. Um, I, when, when, like, it's obviously it sounds and looks like it's a lot. Of, but like once you fall into a routine, I'm, I'd be quite good with routines. Okay. So like once I fall into the routine of I'm doing this, that and the other, it's, it's with everything when you move away from home. You just fall into routines of life. You know what I mean? What, whatever the realm of life you may be in, whether you're, getting up, going to work, and then you've got a job, you've got to go to class or college, something like that. It's a routine. Yeah. So for me, this became my routine, my natural kind of progression of my days. And, and it just, you know, you just kind of don't think about it once you're involved in it so much. Okay, fair enough, yeah. And then how did the opportunity come up to go to the States? So, yeah, so I played in the European Championships that summer. So I've had a couple of looks. Um, but again, just my knowledge of, you know, that side of the world, I just didn't have a whole lot. So I, I didn't know what I was doing, what, what questions I should be asking. Um, so I played in the Euros that summer um, and had a really good tournament, led the tournament in scoring and made the top five or whatever. And from there, I got an offer from Georgia Tech at mm-hmm. the European Championships. And then once I kind of got that offer, a few more started trickling in. Um, and again, just a little bit overwhelmed. I was like, I, make the decision to go to prep school okay so i got a great situation i went to spire institute um everyone would know it now as where the ball. ball went to prep school yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so i was there a couple of years before him and we had a really good team like one, one of my teammates from there came to uic with me oh cool. um we had a bunch of d1 guys um, on our team we played a national circuit so it was it was great experience Okay, yeah. And how come you didn't go professionally from Spain? Because I guess that's probably more of a traditional route from that. Yeah, um, the dream of, of the Division One basketball was there at that point. You know what I mean? By the time I was like 15, 16. Because I was actually, when I was, before I went to England, I was, instead of England, I was supposed to go to Hawaii. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. So the American dream had kind of began at that point. So right. like, this is the, like, professional basketball for me not in, not in an arrogant way but it was always going to be there at a point you know what I mean like mm-hmm. I could have went after being a junior in the Euro- European leagues playing in, in Spain and everything or I could just come after college so it wasn't right. going to change a whole lot for me okay fair enough yeah that makes sense god Hawaii sounds great what happened there did it just fell through um yeah I just kind of just didn't really it was it was like a 
I was supposed to go to I, I was supposed to go to uh, high school in Sacramento. Okay. But if I went to this high school, I was basically committing to go to uh, BYU's D two team in Hawaii. Oh. And at the okay. at the time, I just had no idea of yes. Division One. Well, obviously, I knew what it was, but it wasn't like at that age, I wasn't as tuned in. Yeah. Um, so I obviously, just. Ended up not going there because once I got to England and had some conversations with some people outside of, of the bubble I was already in, it was just new knowledge. Yeah, um, yeah so I know what you mean. Just took my time from that point forward. Yeah, that seems quite not sort of limiting, really. That probably would have limited you in your decision making, obviously, if you gone then too. Yeah, so. yeah, and I would have been quite confined to what mm-hmm. I had agreed to do. You know what I mean? And it was, yeah. yeah. So it was, yeah, it definitely worked out for the best that I did it. Yeah. Exactly. But exactly. that was where the whole American Drink. want mm-hmm. kind of began, you know. Yeah, exactly. So talk us through prep school. You got a um, good few offers. I know you visited a couple of schools, but UIC really stood mm-hmm. out to you. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, again, I was very lucky, very fortunate to play on a national schedule. So a lot of um, – got to play in front of a lot of schools, started getting a few offers. Um, and, yeah, I just started to take a few visits. So I, and then I took a visit to Chicago with absolutely no – intentions of not no intentions but just not expecting what happened to happen you know okay. what i mean I, I didn't it wasn't on my top list you know what i mean it was oh, i'll probably go here 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 before i would go there you know and then i took yeah. the visit and just absolutely fell in love with the city fell in love with the campus loved the way the coaches were you know selling the program and everything so it worked out perfect i really really enjoyed my time there and i'm very happy with my decision and at the time when he was recruiting you, did he give you sort of an expectation of your role coming into the first year? Now, I know later on that had to change because of your academic reasons in the NCAA. Yeah. But what, what was his kind of chat with you about the expectation coming in? Yeah, I mean, initially, like, he, he had seen me playing when I was a three guard. So I was really, like, playing a lot more on the wing. So I was got a lot of what I'm doing now, but just more not playing inside a whole lot. Just okay. all on the wing, trying to get to the rim and whatever way shooting a lot of threes. I wasn't making a whole lot, but I was shooting a lot. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so he kind of seen me a little bit differently. But then when I got there, I kind of put on a bit of weight. Um, obviously, in a good way, you know, we had a great strength coach, great strength team. Yeah. And still was moving quite well. And initially, it started around the three, but then the four, like, I kind of just naturally progressed into that position, like a stretch four, cre- create type four. Um and yeah, I, I love that role, to be honest. So mm-hmm. we kind of, it was always centered around that after my first couple of months there. They were like, oh, we actually see you being quite good in this role for us. So it, um, yeah, it was, it was a smooth transition there as well. Very good. Um, talk us through, I mean, you spoke about another podcast. Um, it was a grey shirt you had to do for your first year, was it? Yeah, so like um, the whole thing, with, I'd been in a couple of different systems. And mm-hmm. honestly, the, the, what happened was, they messed up the readings of, so I was in Irish system, which is um, junior search. So that would be considered like GCSEs yeah. in England. Mm-hmm. GCSEs would be considered a high school diploma in America, but a junior cert wouldn't. So my natural progression was when I left the junior cert, I then started a BTEC level course, a sports oh, course right. in England. So at that point, that started my eligibility uh, clock right. in, in the eyes of the NCAA. And again, just, from lack of knowledge, just didn't know what I was going into, you know what I mean? And then I went into Spain and technically went back into high school. Um, Okay, okay. Yeah, so it was like, because of the course that I had taken, whatever way it was, the way the NCAA viewed it was, that was my junior, senior year of high school. Right, okay, okay. Which in Ireland would be like fourth year, fifth year, sixth year. Yeah. And then there, so basically I had to sit out, we filed a waiver and they gave me a year of being a student, basically. They were like, yeah, you can practice, you can do everything, but you just can't play. You have to prove that you want to be a student. And then that okay. was, I had to get a certain uh, GPA my first year in college so that the NCAA would allow me to play from that point forward. Okay, but your scholarship was still covered under that? Yeah, I was still on full scholarship. I had everything. I, it was literally, I was, it was like, imagine just not playing. Imagine yeah. being the guy that doesn't get any minutes. Yeah. So I was yeah. kind of like that for the year, but I wasn't allowed to suit up or anything. Okay, right. That also just sounds like the NCAA didn't have, at the time, Maybe I don't know if it's changed, but it didn't, doesn't sound like they had much knowledge or experience of... Yeah, I mean, that, like, 
and and that's not me like like maybe they did but the way yeah. it was conveyed to me and the way i pick, picked it up was that they didn't have you know they didn't kind of know but then at the same time i get it because a b-tech in england is they call their school to college you know what yeah. I mean? and then they go from college to sixth form yeah. so because they call it college that's why the ncaa picks it up like that yeah. but really it was kind of like you know in fourth year you do a bunch of modules yeah yeah. It was just basically the equivalent to that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, look, it's complicated. But you got playing after the the year sitting out. Um, how did you find actually again after the full year getting to play? Yeah, um, it was amazing. It was unbelievable. But, you know, I always dreamed and wanted to play on the Division One court. So to start my very first game and, and and play my whole career as a starter was just you know unbelievable. Um, yeah, a, an actual dream come true. Very good. When you got there and maybe when you started games, um, did you realise where at a point, oh, I need to really work at X or Y? Or maybe did you have an edge over your teammates because you had experienced stuff in Europe that maybe they wouldn't have had? Yeah, I mean, everything, like, there were so many advantages, disadvantages. There were a lot of strengths, a lot of weaknesses in my first year that I'd seen. And, like, the one thing I found in college was that you have to become a specialist in your area. You know what okay. I mean? Like you're not like in Europe, I had a lot more freedom yeah. on every team I played on because yeah. I was able to score the basketball in my position because of, I had a lot of mismatches there. Yeah. In, in America, it was different because now everybody is a mismatch. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like every switch you get or anything, that's what American basketball is trying to find where we have one strength and you know what I mean so like yeah whatever you can do to get to that mismatch we're going to get there in America it was very much like that for me that was my perspective in the beginning mm-hmm. um and again the level of players is just so much higher you know what I mean the visual on basketball is unbelievable so mm-hmm. you, I really figure out that you have to become a specialist in your area and and, and be really good at these couple of things and yeah. that's 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 how you stay on the court on your basketball Ireland takeover you had one of the rookies wearing a t-shirt with the Irish flag <laughs> on it. What were your yeah. rookie duties when you were in for your freshman year? So I was very lucky that I, I didn't really get any. Okay. So because um, I had to sit that year out, yeah. uh, I wouldn't travel. So right. I would just stay because I had to show that I'd be a student. So if I don't have to be there, I have to you know be back and not miss class or whatever. So it was, I missed out on all that kind of stuff okay. because I wasn't around in my second year. I was a sophomore. Yeah, and we had freshmen come in, so then naturally so you you, you cheated your you down. nearly cheated your way out of it. What what quarter what sort of yeah. rookie duties did you make the other guys do then? Seeing as you missed, um, them? not a whole lot. You know what I mean, like it's a lot of misconceptions or that kind of stuff. But yeah. they would be the ones carrying the balls, carrying the water, carrying the food onto the bus when we're going, just little things. Um, and then that guy that you're talking about from my takeover. He was one of our managers, um, young kid. He was a freshman at the time. And yeah, just really nice guy. He loved Ireland. <laughs> deadly, deadly, very good. What was the perception like when you when people were saying, oh, where are you from? Now, I know you, you don't maybe typically have a real strong Cork accent, but when, yeah. when you say I'm from Ireland, what do people think? Ah, I mean, my ginger beard. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> Gave it away. Me. They're like, oh, yeah, we've really been <laughs> um, But yeah, yeah, I wouldn't have the strongest, the thickest north side cork accent um yeah. but yeah people people are just so welcoming to irish people every everywhere i've been you know people love irish people yeah um we have a great reputation in a lot of places so it's 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 always very joyous to be welcomed everywhere you know yeah exactly um you spoke about before you uic i guess was was pretty unique in the fact that i think on your takeover the warriors were in using the facility yeah. and a lot of nba players came in i think jabari parker was there and a couple of other people yeah. Uh, I think you said before that you actually managed to to watch them and train against them. Was there anything you picked up just from watching maybe their workouts or from going up against them? Um, yeah, I mean it's the same kind of thing I'm talking about from from college, like being a specialist. Like I watched Mike Dunleavy come in and work out, and Mike Dunleavy is known for being a shooter. Mm-hmm. Mike Dunleavy didn't bounce the ball once in his workout. He came in for forty to forty five minutes. One of our managers rebounded the farm. And our manager didn't move from underneath the rim. Like, it was just because what he does is he's a specialist. You know what I mean? So yeah. all he has to do to get paid is shoot the ball at a very high level. So that's all yeah. he did. He came in and worked his way out and literally didn't miss a shot. I'll never forget it. And we were right. upstairs watching him through our coaches. Um, 
glass windows or whatever. So it was, we could see the workouts and we were allowed to watch a lot of people work out. And that was the thing. Like everyone will just, they will work on exactly what they need to do and not like, if they don't do this and this isn't something that they do regularly, they're just not going to do it. Okay. Um, okay. So it's quite, you know, it's, it's different. You know what I mean? It's a lot different to what we'd be used to um, in Ireland and in other places, but yeah, it's, it's, it's high level, you know, it's a lot of fun to be able to see. It. Yeah. Obviously physically they're another class themselves like geez mm-hmm. when you, and then when you look there's another class like Gian, Gian, Giannis and Joel and Bede but if there's any like I guess the intangibles that they have is that one of them that they're just so good at doing what they need to do like that speciality yeah I mean yeah exactly they know they know their body so well they know exactly what they need to do to perform like you look at LeBron the amount of money that he invests mm-hmm. in just his body like a year it's ridiculous um mm-hmm. but the access the things that they have at that level and just the knowledge it's just in abundance. So they're, they're mm-hmm. obviously they're at a level above than, than the rest with all that kind of stuff. Absolutely. I want to talk to you a little bit about college and the college lifestyle because I suppose mm-hmm. um, it, it's a realistic thing. When you go to college in the States, it's quite a, like a party scene maybe. What's it like having yeah. to navigate? Yes, you're in college, you have freedom, but having the discipline to know what to do, what um, not to do. Yeah. I mean, it gets old quick. Oh, does it? Okay. <laughs> you know I mean, like, like, there's only so many parties you can go to before you're like, ah, I'll skip this one. Yeah. And then you're just not, you know what I mean? And, and, and again, like the personality change, like my first two years, I would have been a lot more social. Not that I wasn't social, but just a lot more willing to just go places and do stuff. And yeah. And uh, then I like my junior and senior year, and I don't think I, I could count how many times I went out on one hand. Okay. Um, yeah, I just, you mean you grow up you mature like the scenes that you're in are a bit different you know you're not really kind of going to parties now you can but it's like you know it's quite it's easy do you know what i mean like okay. you you figure it out quite quite easy to quite oh. quickly okay yeah i know what you mean your senior year i think it was the summer before you tore your acl uh, talk us through mm-hmm. a little bit of that and that process because you came back in ridiculous time i actually think you might nearly have the world record for the quickest recovery <laughs> yeah um i yeah look i was very very lucky with people I had around me um during that time you know off the court I, I had a very close circle around me and and they can be very positive and then um my staff for rehab and treatment and all that kind of stuff was just unbelievable you know jenny and we had access to like the team the usa olympic doctor this summer mm-hmm. He was the one, and he's been the doctor for years. Um, he was the one who did my surgery and like wow. oversee all my rehab and all that kind of stuff and all my checkups with him after a couple of weeks. And so I, I was in great hands. Um, and yeah, they, they were amazing. I wouldn't be able to make it back that quick if it wasn't for them. Yeah, because um, how long till you were running after surgery? Um, so I was like, I was fully cleared. Um, I passed all my tests for returning to play just under five months. Jesus. Um, yeah, so it was like four months and, I mean, three months and four months and 20 something days. Gee, um, back. And you obviously then just attacked your rehab. Like, as you said there, yeah. the support staff, it's different to, let's say, Ireland, where that's their job. Their job is to yeah. get Jordan Bland back on the court. So you obviously just then attacked your rehab with them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I, I was going twice a day. Like, my first day after surgery, I went straight to rehab the following day. Wow. Um, didn't do a whole lot, but it was just like, just to be there mentally, like this is, I'm, I'm here to do it. And, and from that point on, like the first week was tough just from pain. Yeah. Um, But after that, then it was just, you know, I, I was every, every day going two, three times a day. Yeah. You know, rehab twice a day, treatment once a day. And, and I had a bunch of things at home, like knee machines to help me bend my knee, yeah. ice machines, all that kind of stuff. So mm. again, just the access to equipment that america has is just unbelievable mm-hmm. well, i remember we had a phone call i think it was last february or march and you said about you had a diary that you wrote down every mm-hmm. day about how you yeah. like felt and how, can you take us through a little bit of that and why yeah you- so it was actually a recommendation from trish nolan okay. um she was someone that would be very 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 close to me i would just always be one of those people that looks out for me and, and from a personal point of view rather than checking in on games and stuff like that it's more yeah. checking in on me mm-hmm. um, and she was just like look just she would always for years she's been trying to get me to do it mm-hmm. and at that point then I was like I'm gonna do it um so I did it for most of my rehab days and literally just writing down whatever I was feeling whatever I was thinking in that very moment that I decided to write and 
yeah, just the difference from day from day one to day five was ridiculous. And then yeah. day five to twenty something was ridiculous. It was just good to see it, you know what I mean? Yeah. Do you reflect back much on your diary? Do you can you flick back to let's say Um not really. Like every now and then it would I would think about it, but like yeah, ever since I got cleared, I just kinda you know, just don't really think about it anymore. It was okay. part of it, it was just something that happened. Yeah. Um and yeah, because I made it back so quick, I think that's kind of what makes it feel like that, you know, because there's a lot of injuries that you come back from in five months. And yeah. that's quite, you know what I mean, good recovery. You know, where a lot of people aren't so lucky exactly. to, you know I mean? A lot of people suffer a lot longer with that kind of injury. So mm-hmm. I was lucky that it was a short stint. I played most of the season. And mm-hmm. yeah, just something I moved on from. Do you still keep a diary now out of interest? No, I wouldn't say I, I do. Um, no. Uh, I would write down things sometimes, but I wouldn't be as like every day writing stuff down. Or, okay. you know what I mean, if, yeah. if some days I will, some days I won't. Yeah, fair enough. I remember listening to your Hoopfolio podcast and they're worried about the mental side of it. And I think your first session back, you like threw yourself across the floor yeah. for a ball. <laughs> you're, fa- you're mad, yeah. Jordan. You're actually mad. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like for me, that was just because I know if, if I'm going to come back and I'm going to be playing like I'm going to be doing the things that I'm going to do so yeah. my first play well, I was like let me try let me see how I feel you know what I mean if it's going to happen if something bad happens it's going to happen yeah. I'm out here now I've been cleared so yeah. it's just trying to break that mental block or not even trying to break it just trying to never have one yeah so it was like first opportunity I had tapped the ball away from somebody and just dove just went just see how it feels felt fine and okay perfect you know, I'm, I'm good. I'm good now. You know. Yeah, yeah. It was kind of like that reassurance you needed for yourself, where like, oh look, I'm grand. Like you kind of need that yeah. first hit to really know you're back. Yeah, no, exactly. Because it, it's it was unknown territory. Like I'd never had an injury like that. You yeah. know? So I, I don't know how I'm supposed to feel. So all these feelings that I have physically um, are new and different. So I have to try and figure them out. Yeah, exactly. What was it like then getting back on the court? I think your first game you're on ESPN top. <laughs> Ten or yeah, something. it was actually actually cost us that game. Um, oh, did you? I, oh. Like, so I was on a minute restriction. No, I'm not saying that with pride or anything. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I was I was supposed to be on a minute restriction, so I was supposed to be only allowed to play eight minutes. So I played four minutes in the first half. I played quite well, and then in the second half, I played four minutes. But coach left me in for five, and then I come off and. Um, the game is really close and I was playing well. So I was like, I was going to my trainer and my physio and she's like, no, like it's not happening. This is, right. this was like five months and two weeks, I think. Yeah. It was like two or three weeks before I really, the six month mark. Right. Um, so I looked up the doctor, the USA doctor was in the stands because he would travel with us to games. Yeah. And I was like, doc, can I, can I please play? And he came down and he was like, yeah, let him go. So I went back in and I ended up playing, I think it was 11 or 13 minutes. Um, but yeah, I messed up the last two plays of the game, and uh, yeah, I messed up two ball screen coverages. Um, and they hit a three on one, they hit a two on another, and we ended up losing like I think it was two. Okay, okay, right. Yeah, so that's a bit of. A I got I begged begged for him to let me stay in, and then cost the game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it didn't go that well. It isn't um, yeah. team wise. But what was it like then afterwards? Were you were you fairly stiff now the next day, or were you all right? Um, I was fine. Like, yeah, it was sore because yeah. it was just, it was new. Do you know yeah. what I mean? It was, it was, it was new. It was unknown. So I was sore. I wouldn't say I was very stiff. I, again, great treatment, great rehab right afterwards. And, you know, my rehab never stopped. Even okay. when I got back, I had to still do it every single day. Um, and then just got a lot more treatment, got a lot more um, taken care of, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And I was fine. I, I, you know, again, shout out to the backroom staff that we had because they were just incredible. And talk us through the rest of that season. Um, how did it go for the remaining games? Yeah, like we had a really good season. You know, I had a good year. Um, ended up getting like after one, after two games, um, back onto the same five. And and personally, I felt great. You know that I was mm-hmm. made it back to that level and didn't really, you know, miss a whole lot. Um, and then we had a great year as a team. You know, we made it all the way to the conference championship. Um, Ended up losing in the final right before COVID struck. Okay. So, um, yeah, it was a good season. That obviously could have been better. And we really wanted to win. And we thought we were going to. Um, but, yeah, all in all, it was a good season for a lot of people. And did the conference final, what date was that around for internal? I remember the exact date. But I know 
we played on a Tuesday. So we played on a Tuesday night okay. and I flew home that Sunday because that Thursday, the NBA shut down. Yes. And then Friday, Trump announced that he was putting in a flight ban from Monday forward. Yeah. So I ended up flying out Sunday. And right the, before that. the team then, because you're a senior, it was a little bit different. You obviously, they were like, okay, you can go. Like, there was no requirement yeah, for I you mean, to stay. Yeah, I mean, like, the minute the NBA got cancelled, I went straight over to our offices and yeah. I spoke with our assistant, assistant athletic director, Michael Gamartin was his name. Um, great person, just really good guy, looked out for you on a lot of different aspects outside of sport. And I was just like, hey, if I'm going to be stuck in quarantine or in a lockdown where I can't leave, I would rather do that at home. You know, I, I it was the longest period I had to be at home around my family, so it was really good. But they were super, yeah, they were like, yeah, no problem. Let's get a flight. Let's get the best one. Like that, no problem. And, Brilliant. Um, got back that Sunday. Brilliant. So then you spend time at home. Um, you obviously had aspirations to go pro for a long time. When did you really start to, when did you sign with your agent, agent and when did you look at teams that summer? Yeah, so signed my agency soon after that, soon after um, I graduated, so around May. Okay. Um. And yeah, again, just I always spoke about going back to play in Spain. Even when I was in college, when I was in my second, third year, I was like, yeah, I want to go to Spain. That's kind of where I want to go and I had the opportunity to go to. And, and yeah, it was um, it was a good experience. And how did you find then going from a college student where you have other academic commitments, other commitments outside of the out of basketball to a professional and having free time outside of basketball and you're being paid just for um, basketball? Yeah, no, it was amazing. It's so we always wanted and always spoke about in college. We're like, man, I'd love if I could just do this without yeah. class. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> do you yeah, know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Right. So like finally got that opportunity and just gives you a lot more time to take care of your body, more just focused on what you need to do. And um from a sport aspect, it's you know, just nothing more you could want. So it was um yeah, it's unbelievable. I love it. Yeah. You eventually then signed to play with your Cork uh teammate Adrian O'Sullivan. <laughs> Talk us through yeah. how that all came together. It's a pretty cool experience. Um, yeah, so I, I signed a short-term contract with a team in Lev Gold. And when that contract came to a close, I had a couple of different options to stay in Lev Gold or come play for a couple of teams in Lev Silver. Um, and the opportunity came to go and play for Adrian, the team that Adrian was on. So um, I just thought to myself, like, the year right after COVID, where the market is kind of still a bit crazy if there's ever a chance I get to play with let alone another Irish person but like somebody from where I grew up I was like it's probably never gonna happen again so jumped yeah. at the opportunity very good what's it what's the actual difference then you've played both levels what would be the difference between Leb Gold and Leb Silver um again I think it comes back down to being a specialist okay. in, in in the things that you do you know what I mean like you look at we had a guy on our team his name was Casper he was from um was it Lafia? Um, and there was two or three things that he really did when he came off the screen. Like whenever we said screen for him, one, two, catch, that's a shot. That's all. And we know that's what he's going to do. Yeah. And when he goes left, we know he's going to take one or two dribbles and this or that. You know what I mean? So it's like, again, just broken down into being refined here, not refined, but just, you know, knowing your role and, and executing it to the best you can. So what would be then your role if you were to look at your specialist? What would be your attributes? Um, so I think one thing that I really do is really, really, uh, really do well is facilitate, um, in a number of different ways. Um, whether that be facilitating on defense or facilitating on offense, I think my role would be to be a defensive anchor in terms of directing a lot of traffic, being that kind of guy. That's something that me and this coach spoke about quite a lot. And then from an offensive point of view, just keeping the energy, you know, one thing that I love and take pride in is just knowing the game. So. Okay. When things break down or when something doesn't work, something doesn't go to plan, being able to just play off it and play without plays, I think it's huge. So just being a facilitator, I think. Okay. And as a coach, then, how would I teach my players to be a facilitator? How do I instill that in them? Um, you know, it's, I don't know. It's it's hard. Like, it's, it's again, like, I, I've been very lucky to be around really good players. I, I've been around really good vets. I've been around really good people in their positions. And again, I've played a lot of positions. Yeah. So it's like bringing that all together and, and understanding the game from each position and knowing how to play them all and then being able to 
help everyone in each position and, and know what's going to happen in this area and that area it's it, it's it, it comes from experience you know mm. so yeah um in terms of teaching obviously there's a lot of things you can teach but I think experience a lot of times like basketball is a game of feel yeah um so a lot of things you just got to experience it and I get the sense as well it's sort of a mindset choice that you need like I need to make a decision right do you know what I might not score 20 or 30 yeah. a game but I might yeah. have 10 assists and set up everybody else on my team yeah exactly and it's like it's just whatever whatever the team needs you know what I mean yeah. it's I'm trying to win no matter what kind of game I'm playing whether that means I go out and I try to get 10 assists or I go out and try and get 20 points whatever the game brings and, and you know what I mean it's you don't um again it's a feel because you go in you start the game and you feel like okay this is what I feel I need to do and um yeah so speaking of this summer um the Irish senior men's team won the European or the small sorry the European championships for small countries in Dublin yeah. it's quite a mouthful um talk <laughs> us through that experience the bubble in the Louis Fitz you has won all four games fairly convincingly um talk us through that whole experience yeah um Matt it was such an amazing time um I will always look back on it with um a lot of pride um but just it was just a really good time we had a great bunch of people we got to do something very special something that not a lot of people get to do in, in, in Ireland um, and again I spoke about this on a number of occasions after basketball in Ireland now I know we just got the date September 20th to return to yeah. full contact and everything where we need to be but like before that point the only basketball in Ireland I think was 18 months before that mm-hmm. so to, to be able to obviously we didn't have fans but like the BI staff that were in there you know did a great job of, of, of everything you know how they conducted the tournament and how they cheered us on and everything in between. Um, but just to be able to do it on a home court after a time that was so hard for the basketball community just felt so special. Mm-hmm. You certainly made up for the lack of supporters. The noise you individually made. <laughs> the amount of like whooping, I don't know how to describe it. You were just screaming the entire time. Yeah. Um yeah, I mean it was it was it was a fun tournament for us. You know, we we there was a, an unspoken feeling of, I don't know how to explain it, but it was like we all felt like we were there to do a job, um, felt a little bit more responsibility for the basketball community um, in a sense. And it was just, you know, everything we did, we were just trying to be together. And it was it was a little bit bigger. It was No, it was. It was bigger than us. Do you know what I mean? It was mm-hmm. more for, for, it was huge for the Irish basketball community. Speaking of the Irish basketball community, and I guess it shows how far we've come, but um, at one stage, uh, when I was there anyway, I think it did happen the other games, yourself, John, Sean and CJ were on the court at the same time. So that's four former or current Division One players because CJ's obviously going to Lafayette. Yeah. That just yeah, no. shows the strength of the, the Irish Yeah, the, the level that we've come to, do you know what I mean? It's a credit to um, everyone that's, that, that's going away and pursuing their dreams and, and playing in all these different places. Um, like we're going to be at a point I spoke about a lot with a lot of different people this summer we're going to be at a point in a couple of years where we're going to be putting out 10, 11 and hopefully 12 Irish pros do you know what I mean and not yeah. and that's like again like when we get Americans we are afraid of Americans like we had Will this summer mm-hmm. unbelievable guy had Irish connections before that you know just fitted right into our group and it was amazing so he was a great person and mm-hmm. we were so happy to have him but as an Irish community to say that we can now potentially put out 12 pros in the next couple of years to come i'm right now playing with four or five and a couple of d1 guys you know it's 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 testament to the growth that we've had from people going overseas absolutely you obviously interacted with a lot of people i think overseas i think you met you met or you went to one of sean jenkins's game what's yeah. it like to be one of those trailblazers because i know a lot of the kids who are there now would have looked up to you what's it like to meet them and obviously i know you're friends with some of them but yeah. to now see a lot of them go away and be like, oh, that's really cool because, yes, I wasn't the first one, but I a lot of them looked yeah. to No, it's amazing. I, I look back to, like, when I was starting my journey, there wasn't a whole lot of people that could have given me a whole lot of advice um, because a lot, a lot of people had done it before. And if they had, they were very far removed from when they'd done it, so the yeah. landscape had changed a whole lot. So it was different. But, like, Jason Clean. Um, would have spoken to me a lot, a lot when I was younger and again Jerry would have helped me a lot but like it was just such a different environment from when they had been a part of those settings so yeah. I think now having people like me John Sean 
um, Flood doing it and have done it and are now on the other side doing what the next step is to have people so close to your age and, and, and have them help you because it's identical. You know what yeah. I mean? Like in terms of what, what they will be going through and what we went through, it's two or three years in the difference, but like the landscape changes from the level of basketball that we're at and mm. where they are in their careers. So it's, it's huge to have someone in the same journey at the same time, close to your age, being able to help you and give advice. So like, I love seeing all the Irish people away and how great they're doing and love being able to talk to them and give them any type of advice that I can. What's sort of the most common advice you'd give to a lot of them? I know everyone's different and has different issues or different questions for you, but what would be yeah. sort of the common themes? Um, just be an absolute sponge, you know what I mean? Um, and build relationships. You know, a relationship building is huge. Um, later in life when you get past college and yeah. you're looking to do things and, and you the, the, the opportunities that you have in America to build relationships with some really amazing people that, um want to do things for the right reasons it's, it's huge so build relationships and just be a sponge on the court you know what i mean take in everything from everybody meet everyone do everything um so yeah that would be the two most you know generic type things but then obviously try to be a bit personal with it mm-hmm. if you were to combine that where you're looking at now the kids coming up and the likes of yourselves moving forward basketball is in a really good place what can we expect from the irish senior men's team over the next couple of years um man like for me every time i step on the court i'm trying to win you know no matter what game i'm playing no matter who i'm playing against so yeah i mean obviously we're hoping um that you're going to see a whole lot of winning you know we've got the euro basketball qualifiers coming up yeah um they started first in uh november um and obviously again just trying to win every game we win this then we get to the next stage of it and hopefully we build from there um but yeah you know we're we're in the right path, we're heading in the right direction and, and the right people are involved. So it's a very exciting time. For yourself personally, uh, what's the ultimate goal or dream? Um, my, my, now my, my goals kind of changed after this summer, do you know what I mean? Because the yeah. realization came that we can really do something with this with, with this national team. Now, I, I knew it before and I always had the feeling where I was like, you know, we, we need to break this barrier. You yeah. mean, we need to win. We need to win something. Yeah. And then we need to move on. So now, like, my goal is to try and go as far as I can with the national team and really, like, put a lot of time and effort and thought into it. Because, again, if we get to a level of, you know, by the time, like, I'm only 24 still. So I have a lot of years of playing. If we get to the point where we're bringing big teams like France and Spain and Italy – we're bringing them to play in the arena mm-hmm. and we're going to play them. That's NBA players coming for the kids to watch and the younger generations to see. And, and it's just, yeah, it's it's a very exciting time for the next five to 10 years. I think in Irish basketball, we're going to see a lot of growth. Absolutely. For yourself, um, you're only 24, as you said. So I don't know, I might be asking this pr- a bit prematurely, but when you do retire from sport, which is a long way away, uh, what do you want to be remembered for? Uh, my, my heart. Um, I think every time I play, I try to play as hard as I can um, to the best of my ability, no matter what. So if I be remembered for just someone who really gave it all every time I played, I'll be a very happy person. Love it. Um, I just want to pull one more thing from our conversation um, earlier this year. You said chase being content over happiness. Can you explain that a little bit to the listeners? I'm sorry, say that again. Oh, sorry, you said uh, chase being content over like happiness. Um, yeah, yeah. Can you explain that one a little bit? Um, yeah, that was, I, I, I studied psychology in, in college, so I try to act like I'm a psychologist sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, like you look at like, like the opposite, the, the opposite of happiness is sadness. And we would never encourage someone to be sad because that's an extreme, you know, happiness is also an extreme. Um, whereas, you know, content is just a happy medium, you know, and, and you're doing what you need to do. Like I always kind of found that because like, that was more so for people like playing basketball overseas because it's it's a different kind of world that you're in, you know what I mean? Yeah. And it's it's there's a lot of highs and there's a lot of lows. Um and the highs are high, but they're fleeting. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like those high moments are very fleeting moments. Um and then the low moments can they can linger, you know what I mean? So for, for people like that, and, and a lot of people go through it, and it's again just being able to give advice to people who are going through the same thing you're going through while you're doing. You know what I mean? Now when you're removed and, oh, I remember when. Well, no, man, I'm actually, I feel the exact same way. Do you know what I mean? So it's like trying to find a happy medium with, with, with what you're doing and with your journey. And, you know, that would be, that was, that was why I said that. 
Yeah. Is that something you maybe struggled with when you were younger? That kind of trying to get a happy medium of both? Because you said there it's probably hard when basketball is so like yeah, you know, on scholarship yeah. or something. I mean, the, the, the perspective I took is like, I'm here to do a job. Mm-hmm. Um, when I was in college, when I was in professionally, I'm here to do a job and that's what I'm here to do, you know? And, and if I don't do my job, then, you know, somebody else will. Um, yeah. So it was like, like, when tough things happen in life or tough things outside of the basketball can affect your emotions a lot. So it's, it's kind of, and your your highs also come from life, but like a lot of your highs come from the sports you're playing. So yep. if sometimes they're not there and then the two lows are mixing, it's it's quite, you know, people can get bogged down. So for me, from again, an early age, I was quite lucky to hear on people that taught me, like my dad was huge in that in terms of just having to handle myself, mm-hmm. um, control my emotions and separate them and compartmentalize and, just finding that happy medium. Yeah, exactly. There's going to be a lot of the younger players listening to you and looking up to you. Is there anything that we're overlooking uh, or we don't maybe kind of underrate maybe for the younger players, whether it's skill or maybe it's something to do with working out because you said when you're younger, yeah. you had something there. Yeah, I, man, I would say mobility is huge. Okay. Mobility workouts and yeah. stuff like that. Because again, when I was young, I would never stretch. I would just come in, run around the gym, and I could do that up until I was 21, 22. Yeah. And then when I got 21, 22, I'm like, my goodness. <laughs> and again, that's still so young, but then yeah. I finally, like, find mobility. Yeah. And and it just changes how I feel about everything. So it's like, I would tell young kids, just, you know, focus on that kind of thing, so it can change a lot about how you play and a lot about how you move. Um, and then just, just, you know, the, the overall happiness of doing what you're doing. Um, just don't forget why you're doing it um, and always you know trying to be as mentally sound as you can be you know all wellness um, and health and well-being all that kind of stuff it's a lot of times that gets overlooked so yeah. um, there's obviously a lot of resources there for people but just you know just remain happy and, and remind yourself why you're doing it brilliant I'm going to move on to the sideline seven it's the same seven questions at the end of every episode question one what is your favorite quote? Oh, my favorite quote. Wow, there's a lot. <laughs> um, I think it would probably, like, from, from a basketball perspective, it would be Michael Jordan's one about how many times he's missed, failed, all that kind of thing. And that's why he's been able to be so great. Do you know what I mean? Because, again, when you talk about lows and your highs, you got to, again, find that, you know, point where, where you're happy. Love it. Question two, best sporting event you've been to? Best sporting event that I've been to. Um, I was at an NBA Finals game when 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 Kyrie and LeBron were in Cleveland. Um, I'm not a Finals game, a playoff game. Um, so that was quite amazing. Um, but I got to be at a bunch of high level basketball games, NBA games. So that that was always a lot of fun. What's your favorite sporting event that you've been involved in? Man, this summer the, the European Championships. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go, hundred percent. Biggest setback or challenge so far in your career? Um, the biggest challenge would probably have been the the passing of my my dad that last year. So, I'm um, just trying to deal and overcome that with still again having to do a job. So, yeah, that would probably be the biggest challenge. Mm-hmm. Uh, your biggest achievement on or off the court? Biggest achievement. Um, on the court, probably being leading scorer of the European Championships or the MVP of um, the early tournament. And then off the court, having my dad uh, interviewed by ESPN. Oh, damn. It was something, yeah, it was absolutely huge for us as a family. It was something we would joke and laugh about when I was a little kid. So playing the game and looking over and seeing ESPN interview, it was a super, super proud moment. Yeah, I'd say so. Um, dream dinner guest and why? Dream dinner guest and why? Kobe, hundred percent. Yeah, um, easy. He was my idol when I was younger. From a basketball perspective and a life perspective, just how he conducts himself and and everything he does is just unbelievable. Advice to your eighteen year old self? Advice to my eighteen year old self. I actually had this question a couple of weeks ago as well in a, a different interview, and it would be um, be more of a kid when I was traveling to all these different places and everything I was just so do you know what I mean not nonchalant but just didn't really take in the environments as well as I probably could have yeah in terms of the cultures of the places I was in so I was just trying to be more of a kid just try to experience a bit more um with the places that I've been 
Final question before I let you go. If your life was a book, what chapter would this be called? Oof. Man, uh, growth. <laughs> okay, just, on and off yeah, the course. Yeah, 100%. Um, I just feel like this is a big year uh, for me personally and from a sport point of view. And, and again, being a part of the whole the new national team setups and going forward. Um, yeah, I just feel like this year, is, this year and these coming years will be a lot of growth. Brilliant. Jordan, I just want to thank you so much for your time. The very best of luck this year. I'm looking forward to okay. watching the Eurobasket qualifiers and just thanks again. Yeah, no, thank you very much. I enjoyed it. A big thank you to Jordan for coming on today. I thoroughly enjoyed our chat and I hope you did too. I'll be sure to leave all of his links in the description box below and I just want to wish him the very best of luck next year. If you did enjoy the episode and you are listening on Apple Podcasts, I'd really appreciate if you could leave a rating and a review as it does help the show grow. Be sure to check out the brand new website, thesidelandlive.com for more. Thanks a million for listening and I'll catch you in the next one.